So, looks like a few days ago, Josh Peck put out a video uh, asking the question whether EDE theory debunks flat Earth. EDE theory meaning extra-dimensional Earth. Um, and the short answer is no, of course. Honestly, it even pains me that this that a conversation like this would even be happening at this point, considering that uh, I've been talking about this for over a year. Uh, this is one of the this is one of the the primary things. I mean, honestly, this is one thing that even before I had finished looking into all the research in terms of things like curvature and uh, the space programs and uh, you know gravitational theory and gyroscopes and so you know all these all these sorts of evidences. But it was when I was just thinking about it from the biblical standpoint, and as I began to to learn what the original Hebrew cosmology was, since I'd never even learned it before, with some type of dome firmament and the sky, and then the waters above, and then the Sheol below, and had this kind of simple picture drawn, drawn out for me. <laughs> when I started to understand that picture in the context of extra-dimensional you know, spiritual realms, which overlap the physical realm that's that was what compelled me almost more than anything at least in the beginning and it still does in terms of why it just brings so many things in the bible alive and this is what i think is just so mind-boggling to me and sadly it's not that mind-boggling i suppose when you know he starts off just by quoting uh, physicists and you know talking about dark matter and dark energy and, and all these things which uh, I, I don't even comprehend how you can, on the one hand, take a stance of where you're you're questioning physics and things like CERN in terms of what are their spiritual implications and what is the enemy trying to do with these kinds of technologies. <laughs> Which, of course, the physicists who work there would, you know, laugh in your face if you even ask those kind of questions. But then to just turn around and blindly regurgitate everything else these physicists have to say about the universe, even though, you know, they would they would just as adamantly ins insist that uh, the Earth, you know, exploded from a single uh, a singularity point 14 billion years ago, and they would they would insist that it was just as just as much a fact of science and physics as is you know dark matter and dark energy. So how do you how do you pick and choose? How do you like how do you balk at questioning? All of it, but you you can question certain things or just flat out deny certain things. But then the other, all the rest of it, you're going to try and just force it to to synthesize with the Bible. And so basically, in a nutshell, to you know, he talks for over an hour about EDE theory debunking flat Earth, and this entire discussion is is essentially just built around the the single false assumption that enclosed cosmology does not incorporate um, extra dimensional reality and I I honestly don't know how at this point he could even where he gets such an idea I suppose if you're looking at um, a non you know y y there's of course all sorts of representations of flat earth out there and if you're just gonna go and look at the the flimsiest ones or the people that aren't even coming from a biblical perspective then sure you know you got your infinite plane people and you know simulation theory and all you know you, you every you got quasi-luminous out there, you know, with <laughs> trying to escape through the North Pole. And so, you know, once you bring it back to the biblical p perspective, it's really not that complicated. And flat enclosed cosmology still w makes far more sense than trying to use extra-dimensional theory to synthesize everything we read in the Bible with the Copernican universe. Because there's a, a lot of... Uh, contradictions that he's just kind of skipping over and omitting whether by design or whether by he just doesn't realize he's doing it I think a lot of it is still he's just stuck in this old paradigm because he it's all you know he didn't have to let go of a lot he'd have to let go of all this stuff on quantum physics that he's now written a book on that yeah that that's that's a difficult step right so you know I, I feel your pain Josh but good grief I absolutely get the whole flatland analogy. I think it's a perfect way of trying to kind of allegorically understand higher dimensions, even though we can't experience them directly. But at the same time, what I think keeps, you know, what I think you, you have to be careful not to do is use extra dimensional theory to, as just basically a convenient way of allegorizing away everything that doesn't seem to fit in with the Copernican paradigm. And that's essentially what's happening here, because the and this is what it just doesn't make sense. Once I started to understand how the firmament 
is sort of taught in these conflicting and contradictory ways within modern, you know, heliocentric uh, creationism. Because like Josh said, on the one hand, you're, you're talking about the firmament being a barrier between between three-dimensional space-time and then higher dimensions, which actually in a closed cosmology, that's absolutely what it is. I think it's, if anything, it's, it's sort of the ultimate barrier. But of course, that doesn't mean that it's not also physical in the sense of it existing in our three-dimensional space. So just like you've talked about many things being things in higher dimensions that can pierce through, like with the flatland analogy, if a three-dimensional being pokes its finger through the two-dimensional plane, you're seeing a two-dimensional slice of a three-dimensional object, whereas higher dimensional objects, you know, what we, all we can see is a three-dimensional slice of a hyper-dimensional part of, aspect of creation, but, you know, the, a higher dimensional construct. And again, when we're talking about uh, pillars and corners of the earth and the bowels of the earth and all these things, yes, there's extra dimensional, higher dimensional things, but you can't, but I think the real, the real telling part of that whole conversation is when you get into to the discussion of where the intersect is. Like, how does that really work? That's what the real, because because otherwise the, the whole conversation is pointless. We can just, I could just take anything in the Bible that just doesn't seem to fit with whatever we're debating and just say, oh, well, that's just, that's just talking about something in a higher dimension. So it could mean whatever. And that gets, I think that's a slippery slope, honestly, because and this is what is weird is that you hear these arguments from certain people that like Mike Heiser when he's trying to debunk the flat earth and saying well this was written for the perspective of people that are you know living in that culture in that time and so it's kind of speaking at their level so that they can understand and I don't know how you can kind of make those sorts of flimsy arguments but then turn around and and then argue basically argue that all these things that are, all this language that we're getting, like when we're saying depths or pit or heights or heavens or, you know, went up to heaven, um, that this is just basically allegorical language because of, um, you know, extra dimensional realities. But, but again, it comes down to the intersect. Like, for instance, when you, when you really think about it, to say that Jesus ascended up to heaven, in a heliocentric concept, you know, from the Mount of Olives, from a heliocentric model, what you're saying is that Jesus went up into the sky from a ball earth. You know, he didn't, he wasn't really pointed in the direction of heaven. Heaven is everywhere because it's extra dimensional. Uh, you know, the highest dimensional plane, I suppose. And so he, so Jesus floated up into the sky and then at some point dimensionally ascended, you know, essentially would have disappeared from our sense. But, you know, it begs the question as to why he had to, why he had to go up in the sky in the first place, and it's the, it's the same thing with everything. Like why, why do we always see that, like when the watchers came down, and um, you know we look at all these mythologies around the world where they're gods, they came from the stars, they came from heaven, and from a Christian Genesis six perspective, we can look at that and say, yeah, these were those were the watcher angels that came down and taught things to men and you know ruled kingdoms essentially were worshipped as gods and they were just fallen angels but they came from the sky so on the one hand you're saying well they materialized from the higher heavenly dimensions but then they also appeared to come from outer space right so you're kind of using them in tandem well in the very least all these arguments could still happen within a close cosmology and I'm in what I and that's what I think is it's really an unfair move to then pretend like you don't couldn't comprehend that if what you're seeing in the sky above is like the sun moon and stars themselves are really just three-dimensional slices of extra-dimensional objects or luminaries or however they you know to, to the, so that we really don't understand how they they work um so you can't so how to on the one hand you introduce the idea that well there's all these extra-dimensional possibilities that you know would sort of explain why there's so much mystery to the cosmos but you're only going to allow yourself to even consider such ideas when it it's coming from the mouths of the secular uh, humanist evolution believing you know quantum physicists <laughs> like really when they're talking about dark matter dark energy and there's all this unaccounted for mass and um, you know the 
our equations show that there's a gravitational pull that, you know, we can't get. It's like, that's all Big Bang physics. I hate to tell you. you <laughs> the idea that you're even trying to point to that and, and act like that is harmonious with the Bible is itself, you're lying to yourself. Like, they... <laughs> Those physicists, those genius mathematicians, would mock you as an idiot for believing in uh, a young world or a world that was created by, uh, created out of nothing by a supreme being, right? Their entire pseudo-scientific system is geared towards eliminating God and eliminating the spiritual realm. But then, of course, it moves back into the spiritual realm with quantum physics and higher, you know. But it's taking the long way around to get back to not biblical spirituality, but it's all moving back towards uh, mysticism, new age, occult spirituality. That's where it's all going. That's why there's a statue of Shiva outside of CERN and, you know, not a, a cross or something. You know, <laughs> who's behind it all? Consider the source. Consider the source. Consider, consider who's funding and pushing and behind all these things. Like trying to point to it in, in in terms of using it to redeem the Bible, you know, this is the this is the trap that that the church has fallen into for a long, long time, trying to use Satan's pseudoscience against him. It's like it's foolishness because we we can't just stop and believe that the Bible could actually mean mean what it says in any capacity. I was just reading the other day in John and. Jesus, it says that Jesus looked up to heaven and he prayed. Well, in a heliocentric universe, according to what Josh is saying, you know, if heaven is just a hyperdimensional reality, then you could essentially look anywhere. You know, the New Age would probably say that, well, that means that Jesus sat down and meditated and, you know, and achieved a higher realm of consciousness and, and you know, looked to heaven. You know, we all know that there's only one sensible way to interpret that verse, and the <laughs> and it is that Jesus looked to the sky and it says he's looking to heaven and prayed. So from our perspective, our three-dimensional construct vantage point, yes, however it works, heaven is up from our perspective because we live within a three-dimensional XYZ dimension of, of space with an absolute up and an absolute down. And those absolute ups and absolute downs are somehow overlapping with extra-dimensional realities of of the pit, of hell, the depths, the abyss, really is down, I think, and heaven really is up from our, maybe from God's perspective, it's not the same, but anyways. Uh, the space programs and uh, you know gravitational theory and gyroscopes and so you know all these all these sorts of evidences but it was when i was just thinking about it from the biblical standpoint and as i began to understand to learn what the original hebrew cosmology was 
since I'd never even learned it before, with some type of dome firmament and the sky, and then the waters above, and then the shield below. And had this kind of simple picture drawn, drawn out for me. You know, he starts off just by quoting uh, physicists and, you know, talking about dark matter and dark energy and, and all these things, which uh, I, I don't even comprehend how you can, on the one hand, take a stance of where you're, you're questioning physics and things like CERN in terms of what are their spiritual implications and what is the enemy trying to do with these kinds of technologies. <laughs> which, of course, the physicists who work there would, you know, laugh in your face if you even asked those kind of questions. But then to just turn around... <laughs> When I started to understand that picture in the context of extra-dimensional you know, spiritual realms, which overlap the physical realm, that's that was what compelled me almost more than anything, at least in the beginning, and it still does, in terms of why it just brings so many things in the Bible alive. And this is what I think is just so mind-boggling to me. And sadly, it's not that mind-boggling, I suppose, when... It debunks flat earth, EDE theory, meaning extra dimensional earth. Um, and the short answer is no, of course. Honestly, it even pains me that this, that a conversation like this would even be happening at this point, considering that uh, I've been talking about this for over a year. Uh, this is one of the, this is one of the, the primary things. I mean, honestly, this is one thing that even before I had finished looking into all the research in terms of things like curvature. And So, looks like a few days ago, Josh Peck put out a video uh, asking the question uh, whether EDE theory 